ABC Listen. Podcasts, radio, news, music and more. Just a heads up, this episode of Schmeitgeist contains some strong language, mental health themes and hold music. So this story starts in November of 2022. I am staring at my laptop, waiting for a telehealth appointment to begin. In fact, I've been waiting months for it. It's a weirdly sticky Sydney afternoon, and I am stuck to my couch because of the humidity, but also because not only have I waited months to see this doctor, I've paid $950 for the privilege. So I don't want to miss a single second of what comes next. And if $950 seems like a lot for a 45-minute appointment, then you should know that in 2023, this is considered a bargain. Because this isn't just any doctor. This is an ADHD psychiatrist. And we are in the middle of a massive ADHD wave. And therefore, an access crisis. More on that later. But not now. Because now, the hold music has finally stopped. And there is a tiny, expensive man on my screen who wants to know everything. And I do not hold back. Uh, It was an arts degree majoring in journalism, but they didn't, I never actually finished it. I get impatient when people don't like finish their sentences fast enough. I get really like angry in traffic. Uh, Number nine. Like I said, I do interrupt people, but I've got better at it. I have got better at it over time. 45 minutes later, it's official. The disembodied head tells me I have ADHD. Great. Okay. Love to hear it. How soon do you think I might be able to, all things being equal, obviously, if it is the right course of action, how soon do you think I might be able to access treatment? Pretty quickly, as it turns out. Like, within a week. As long as I show up to another six months' worth of surprisingly pricey telehealth appointments. But because I have no money and, well, ADHD, it's February before I start meds. Still, it feels like a big moment. The tiny man says goodbye and good luck. He tells me that he hopes my life is about to change. The problem is, I'm not the only one who's been queuing. Because thanks to social media, a lot of us have had the same idea in unison. I think what's pretty common is that people see videos on TikTok and think, oh, maybe I've got ADHD. If you're seeing this, chances are you're just like me. You're probably a 30-something-year-old plant-killing millennial who discovered through this absolute time suck of an app that you have lived with ADHD your entire life and you didn't even know about it. But knowing is only half the battle. Because right now, there are nowhere near enough psychiatrists to see all the people who want treatment. They'd say press two for that, press four for ADHD. And the line went completely blank. And it wasn't just one clinic. It was at least two or three where you'd hit that button and it would just go blank. You couldn't even leave a message. I'm Ange Lavoie-Pierre, and this is Schmeitgeist, the podcast from ABC Everyday that decodes the biggest and weirdest trends in pop culture, coming to you from Gadigal land. And this episode is the first in our two-part investigation into the ADHD diagnosis boom. And it is a boom. The number of Australians on ADHD medication doubled in the decade to 2021. By the middle of that year, there were 1.5 million of us. And we have to imagine what the diagnosis rate has done since then But my last 10 bucks says it hasn't declined. We're looking at the online culture that's feeding it, the access crisis it's created, and the doctors making bank off it. We're seeing clinics popping up everywhere. In some cases, there's just blatant price gouging um, and complete exploitation. In part one, we want to know, how did we get here? I mean, TikTok, sure, but is the ADHD content tsunami convincing more people than it should? These types of memes that make us self-diagnose can sometimes be a way for us to self-soothe. Are all these new diagnoses long overdue? Or just the ultimate internet quiz in action? Are you the ADHD who became really good at planning ahead because your brain made you worried? Or are you the ADHD who procrastinated until you became very good at improvising? I am the second. And if you do have ADHD, 
Then what happens when you can't get help? Over $500 and you have to pay it at time of booking and then wait the 14 to 16 weeks until the appointment. Are you in the queue at the moment? I am not. I don't have 550 bucks to cough up. The amount of people that have called who are suicidal that we've actually been able to turn around, at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. Some of my closest friends have been like, mm, are you sure? I don't think so. You seem fine. Mm. I need help. <laughs> Please, can you help me? Okay, so the episode you're about to hear isn't at all the episode I initially had in mind. The original plan was a fun romp through the weird internet subculture that is ADHD talk. You know, schmeitgeist things. So, obviously, I began by mainlining ADHD memes. Make the plan, execute the plan, expect the plan to go off the rails, throw away the plan. But before long, I found myself treading what is now quite a well-worn path towards a social media-induced self-diagnosis at which point I stumbled right into the unhinged labyrinth of a system we have for diagnosing and treating ADHD in Australia. Honestly, it's like nothing I've ever seen before. And in true ADHD fashion, I couldn't leave it alone. So we're doing both. Next week, we're looking at a new breed of mental health clinic that is rinsing as much cash as they can out of this crisis. But in this episode, we're starting more or less where we were always going to start. On TikTok because that's where this ADHD wave begins. And the reason the system is overwhelmed right now is that it's inundated with people like me, who saw one too many ADHD memes and went to look for help. And there is intense debate over whether or not that's a good thing. Because seen from one angle, this is the ADHD enlightenment era. They don't want you to realise your true potential. The fact that you have an advantage over a neurotypical, the fact that you can enter hyperfocus and turn into a creative genius... The fact that you can learn at five times the speed doing something you love, they don't want you to know your true power. But from another point of view, this is a trend. It's people searching for identity and maybe even attention and landing on ADHD, whether or not they really have it. So we wanted to test that second theory. Has TikTok, and social media more generally, somehow tricked people with completely typical neurochemistry into wanting an ADHD diagnosis? Hello, my name is Sasha. Um, I'm 36 years old and I think I might have ADHD. You think you have ADHD, but you're not sure? Not sure. I am trying to discover whether I have ADHD or not, but it's a bit of a process. It's quite difficult. Maybe you could tell us like, how and when was the first time that the idea that you might have ADHD occurred to you? So again, let's just talk about social media. I started seeing lots of um, memes around around mental health. I was looking into anxiety. I was looking into a bit of depression. And then some of these ones that had a little bit of ADHD content started popping in and things like task paralysis, for instance. Do you have the meme accounts there that kind of kicked you off, do you think? I do have a couple. <laughs> I'm going to look over your shoulder. Let's talk about task paralysis. Now, if you know somebody that experiences task paralysis, but that's not something that you experience, that can be a little frustrating to try and understand. Imagine the worst news that you've ever had to give or the worst breakup that you've ever initiated. It's like that, but with moving. <laughs> <laughs> with surviving or living, I think, could also work there too. It wasn't just that either. There was a lot of ADHD content Sasha saw on socials that over time started to stack up and make her wonder such as the notion of rapid-fire brain. You can even see by the conversation I'm having with myself right now, like, my brain moves a million miles an hour and I cannot make it stop. Somebody freaking medicate me. I need help. And if you want to know what that's like, here's a TikTok about the thoughts this guy thinks whilst walking. Okay, why am I... Okay, this is I'm going to do it. I look like a dick right now. So Sasha added rapid-fire brain to the list. It seems to have ground to a halt right now, but um, <laughs> most of the time, this just won't stay still or be quiet. There's a thousand things bouncing around at any one time. I usually refer to my brain as like a whole heap of ping pong balls being thrown down a hallway. I can relate. So on the one side of this equation, you have people like Sasha and me seeing that kind of ADHD content on social media and having a penny drop moment. And on the other side, you have ADHD content creators. Um, so, yeah, maybe introduce yourself for us to begin with. 
Oh yeah. Sorry, I was like, oh, are we starting? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do it. We started. We we just started right, back starting. there. Um, my name is Kate Osborne. I go by Katieosaurus on all corners of the internet, where I am a ADHD advocate, a mental health educator, and in particular, I talk a lot about the intersection between uh, neurodivergency and intimacy, sex, and relationships. Um, and when I'm not doing that, I also um, advocate and educate about accessibility and inclusivity for neurodivergent emergency in TTRPGs like Dungeons and Dragons cuz I am and I cannot stress this enough very cool. <laughs> oh, you made me do it. That's just what I was going to say. When do you sleep? My goodness, that is so much. I'm learning to sleep this year. That's sort of my 2023 goal. I started making ADHD uh, mental health content on TikTok about three years ago now. Has it really been three? Mm -hmm. I started out of absolute spite. And basically, it came from a place of I couldn't find information about the stuff that affected me. I couldn't find answers about things like how does ADHD affect relationships and intimacy. And so then I sort of kind of said, well, if nobody is making this content, I guess I will. With which order did you figure out you were neurodivergent, queer, and kinky? Let me know in the comments. Okay, bye. Do you kind of like have a sense of who that demo is? <laughs> Um, the joke answer would be that most of my followers are burnt out, gifted, and talented, submissive brats with a praise kink. Um, but no, I mean, in reality, like I have, you know, I have the analytics, I have the metrics. And so for me, the bulk of my following tends to be uh, women between ages 20 and 40. Mm -hmm. um, most of them grew up not knowing that they were neurodivergent. And so they have sort of come to my content as part of their journey of self-discovery and self-understanding. And I, I take that so seriously seriously to get emails from people saying that like you know my video was the reason why they ultimately went to go get a diagnosis or like whatever that's just it's so I don't have words I don't have like adequate emotional words for like what that means to me I can't diagnose you nor can anybody on TikTok diagnose you um but I am gonna walk you through a very real moment in my very real life that just happened to me Sometimes I make very like educational videos like, hey, there's this cool ADHD study that just came out. You know, sometimes it is really simple stuff like, did you know they make light bulbs that don't shine out the bottom so you can deal with overhead lighting easier? But then there's some stuff where I'm just very honest about my experience and, and my frustrations. If you have ADHD, I have a question for you. How often does your lack of impulse control and or your impulsive decision making um, completely fuck up your life and then fill your body with a white hot red? Age. And sometimes it's just stuff she's become obsessed with. Like, I'm going to learn how to make blue paint, like how they did in the <laughs> Renaissance, which is very hard, by the way. It's really? extremely difficult. Did you master it? I'm currently working through it. Okay. I'm growing flowers in my basement to make <laughs> blue paint. It's a whole, it's a whole thing. But not everyone who's posting about ADHD is doing it like Kate. There is a lot of wrong information out there. There are people who want to sell you stuff, maybe an app or ADHD coaching. I feel like we most often talk about the disadvantages of ADHD. However, there are a lot of superpowers that come along with the ADHD neurotype. Occasionally, you find something that's weirdly ideological. Most men have completely lost their way in this society. Most men are turning into females. It's a mess. Or rather, it's the internet. So people might be getting an education, but there is no standard curriculum. And the million-dollar question is, does that mean that some of those people who think they have ADHD are getting it wrong? I mean, one, you, ha you have to be careful because certainly there are bad videos about, you know, ADHD all over the internet that maybe don't have correct information. Um, but at the same time, you have, you know, literally millions that do. And I think part of it is that if you look sort of at like the history of how these things have been studied, there was systemic, I guess bias is maybe the right word, in that most of the time studies focused on young white males. Mm. And that was about it. 
older adults, especially um, people of color, trans people, you know, there's so many people were being left out of the conversation. And then all of a sudden social media happens, right? We have this, you know, literal World Wide Web. I'm a millennial, so that's what we used to call it. Um, you know, we have this World Wide Web of people from marginalized communities, from underrepresented voices who are suddenly having this platform and having this ability to say, this is what my lived experience is. And it might not look exactly like what has been studied before, but that's because nobody was studying it. So not only was no one studying it, but even the goalposts for diagnosis were different. For example, up until 10 years ago, psychiatry's diagnostic Bible, the DSM, had ruled out the possibility of a person having both ADHD and autism. Whereas what we know now is that there's a pretty major overlap, at least 20 or 30 percent, depending on which group you're looking at. So for those reasons, and more, Kate is pretty pissed about the whole narrative that TikTok is causing the ADHD wave coming from some quarters of the media and the mental health profession. Nobody is watching a 15-second TikTok and being like, Welp, it's solved. I've got the ADHD, right? Somebody might watch 30, 40, 50, 100 TikToks and say, wow. And then they start looking it up and then they start doing research. But I'm so exhausted of this, like, everybody who watches ADHD TikTok is convinced they have ADHD. I'm like, that's not what's happening. Like, it's just not it. Okay. So having got that out of the way, I'm just going to press on it a little bit and... No, that's fine. I don't know. I, I want to be really careful with how I word this. But... Sure. Okay. I'm a person who kind of worked it, I worked it out by looking in the first place at memes, at accounts like yours. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, hmm, overhead lights. Mm, I do do that weird thing with my leg. Oh, I have had like a lot of hobbies. Oh, I do have a really uneven transcript. All these things. And I guess, uh, I guess what I'm trying to get at here is there's a part of us that loves to classify things, to put things in categories. We love taxonomies. We love them. That's why we love internet quizzes. Uh, like we want to know which Spice Girl we are. We just can't resist that quiz. <laughs> there you go. Now I'm aging myself too. Um, but I do wonder about how that part of us that craves classification interacts with all this extra awareness about ADHD, particularly at a time when a lot of people are struggling mental health-wise. People are looking for answers and their algorithm is maybe feeding them a lot of ADHD stuff or maybe they stumble across it. They're also having conversations with friends who are curious or getting diagnoses themselves. Add to that the fact that neurodivergence is now celebrated as it should be. You have this total drop in the level of stigma, which is absolutely a great thing. But I think what it does mean is that there are all these tailwinds that are driving people towards diagnosis. We're, we're hungry for external frameworks to understand ourselves. And I do wonder if under those conditions, it's possible that there is a significant number of people who are becoming convinced that they have ADHD when they don't. I mean, I certainly think that it is feasible that there are some people who have like watched a lot of, you know, ADHD TikToks and they're like, oh, I might have ADHD. And they might be incorrect. Maybe they are just disorganized. Maybe they are just, you know, clutter bugs or whatever it may be. Um, I very strongly advocate for those people having resources to help them as well, because there's no ADHD pie, right? There's no autism pie. We're not running out of slices as we hand out diagnoses. <laughs> Everybody in the world deals with sensory issues to a certain extent. Now, when it gets to the point where it's like, oh, my gosh, this is impacting my ability to live and thrive, that's when we start saying, you know, it's sensory processing disorder or something like that and that, you know, autism, et cetera, et cetera. But if somebody watches a video about, you know, hey, you can get these cool capped light bulbs and it, and it you know, impacts their experience, I, I don't think there's a lot of harm in that. The last thing that I'll say, too, is that if you go to the doctor right? And you say, oh my gosh, my arm is swelling and it hurts so much and I can't move it and there's a bone sticking out of it. I think my arm is broken. Your doctor might look and say, well, actually, it looks like your wrist is broken. So we might find out that there's more to the story. Even when we're talking about self-diagnosis, even as we're talking about sort of the rise in ADHD diagnoses across the board, what we're really saying is more people are asking for help. 
And sometimes those people are right. But sometimes they might be dealing with, you know, a broken wrist instead of a broken arm. They're dealing with depression and anxiety and PTSD or something like that. And so I think that learning through social media, learning through independent research is just allowing you the opportunity to really focus on yourself and then going from there. So it's inevitable that not everyone who's convinced they have ADHD necessarily does. Mistakes will happen. But look, maybe they have something else. And as for people in this group who end up getting a formal ADHD diagnosis but don't actually have ADHD, Kate's right. There is no ADHD pie, so we're not running out of pieces. But there are ADHD meds, and if you end up on meds you don't need or the wrong meds, well, that can be dangerous. In general, though, as you might have gathered, Kate sees this as a net positive, even accounting for the occasional misdiagnosis. But the misdiagnosis issue is only part of the argument. The other part of it is that social media has made an ADHD diagnosis seem not only likely to some people, but also desirable. Which might sound far-fetched, but basically the theory goes that ADHD talk is, and this is a technical term, so stay with me, Some sort of topsy-turvy world where the more marginalised you are, the more power you have. And yes, I know, I made it sound ridiculous, but there is a case for this. I am Professor Crystal Aberdeen. I am the founder of the TikTok Cultures Research Network. So Crystal is a digital anthropologist. She studies the dynamics of micro-communities on TikTok, such as ADHD talk. And she's noticed three main subgroups here. Firstly, there are the mental health professionals who got on TikTok during the pandemic to keep their businesses alive. Then TikTok stopped being just for Gen Z and everyone showed up, including people with ADHD, who started talking about what it was like to live with it. And then you get the third group, the people getting served all this content with zero quality control and wondering if they have ADHD too. Suddenly the conversation around ADHD became all at once very normalized, but also very flippant. We were no longer only looking to these trained, qualified experts for discourse. We were no longer only listening to people with lived experiences to tell us what it was like, but anyone and everyone could have a say if they identified with any element of the behavior in ADHD talk. I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, I guess, how hierarchies develop within these communities that we're talking about. Is this a corner of the internet where having ADHD and being able to demonstrate it or signal it clearly and convincingly actually confers some clout? Yes. So ADHD talk, unfortunately, is plagued in this culture where attention and visibility is assigned to people on the basis of competitive one down manship. People have taken the traditional ladder of social hierarchies and social status, where we traditionally privileged wealth, beauty, wellness, and everything in life going perfect A-OK, turned that around and decided to compete on who is worse off. Hey guys, I am experiencing my sad girl era, rolling onto my ADHD. I am medicated. To add to all of that, I'm doing some pretty intense therapy. You can't really pick when you want to unpack trauma. In terms of chronic illness, because my entire digestive system is paralyzed, so is my colon, and that has been causing me a lot of problems. And I feel like we've all seen a version of this online. For example, if you've ever spent more than, I don't know, two minutes on Twitter. Like, it's not a TikTok thing. It's a social media thing. In fact, Crystal has been tracking these dynamics as far back as mental health peer support groups on Facebook. And originally, it was useful. You know, like trading depression memes as a way of saying, hey, you and I, we get each other. We're in this together. And at least we can laugh about it. But if you extrapolate that so that everyone's in the habit of disclosing everything and lived experience is the only qualification that really counts, as well as the fact that you're dealing with strangers online who don't seem real to you, you will land at rampant policing and gatekeeping every time. People who felt that they were at the intersection of multiple marginalities, multiple disabilities, or multiple disadvantages somehow emerged as the most authoritative voice that was given credibility, 
platform space and visibility to speak about an issue. TikTok is an interesting space because the shutting down of someone else's opinion can sometimes not be focused on fact or the discourse, but on the basis that someone occupies a more marginal demographic than you. You know what I think is so freaking frustrating is all these people like coming out saying that they have ADHD now. Like, they're like, oh, like, I'm just really forgetful. It's not that. That's not ADHD. And really, Crystal is just clearly naming something that we've all seen play out at some point. That yes, there is a certain kind of power in saying you have the thing or you are the thing, whatever the thing is. And then you get to talk about the thing and people listen to you. They treat you differently, even if it is only on that one corner of the internet. Maybe it's not even dishonest. Maybe you convince yourself along the way. And however big or small you think that social incentive is, it exists. And on that hunger we seem to have to classify ourselves, Crystal has an interesting theory about why. These types of memes that make us self-diagnose can sometimes be a way for us to self-soothe or individualize a lot of the challenges we're facing as a society, capital S society. So if you're thinking about overwork culture, hustle culture, feeling overwhelmed, overstimulated by the internet, Many of these are systemic issues that we really should address, talking about the education system, talking about the ways we uphold people to work very unrealistic hours in a capitalist society. But those are very difficult, hard conversations to have. Whereas individualizing your struggle and your challenge as maybe I have an illness or a condition, maybe that's why I'm not fitting into quote-unquote mainstream society, that feels like a plausible and also a little bit of a self-soothing solution to what you may be struggling with when you're welcome into the community and people start sharing tips on how to manage life, organize life, um, sign posts to people that your needs are different. That can also come with a bit of comfort and soothing that you're learning new vocabularies to talk about what you're struggling with. And of course, for some of us, that doesn't actually address the big major problems that we really need to reconfigure the way we're living life in late capitalism. But it's one of those short-term solutions where the advice and the comfort is more immediate because you're speaking to other people with solutions you can implement as an individual rather than thinking about how to solve society. And right there, Crystal has nailed something I feel like I've been circling ever since I started looking into this. That is, it is a lot more comfortable sometimes to pathologize yourself than to pathologize the world you live in. Which is not to say that everyone who has diagnosed themselves on ADHD talk got it wrong. That would be a very weird place for me to land this episode, given how my own diagnosis came about. The point is, there are some complicated ways that an ADHD diagnosis does have its own gravitational pull. It's not that people want to have ADHD. But I can see how people are attracted to the idea that they might have had it all along. Because it feels like an answer. And we love answers. Is that gravitational pull strong enough to, quote, cause a massive ADHD diagnosis wave? Probably not. On the other hand, decades of structural underdiagnosis? Maybe. And with or without ADHD, when we do look for help, whether that's for depression or the crushing brutality of late capitalism, we tend to do it online. Something that Kate Osborne, the ADHD talk educator, said that stuck with me was, to paraphrase, maybe we've been looking at this backwards. Like this whole time, we have been testing the theory that TikTok caused the ADHD wave, and therefore the subsequent access crisis. But she sees it the other way around. I'm going to just say it. There's a lot of bad faith actors. There's a lot of companies and for-profit healthcare organizations that have really started just being like, hey, we can help you, um, but the help that they're providing is not adequate. You know, there are people that have reached out to me saying they're on a two-year, three-year wait list to just get an evaluation. You know, you start looking at these like marginalized communities that really struggle with access to healthcare, and it's like, like, of course, of course they are forming online communities and support groups. Of course they are looking towards each other to hopefully find some support because there are no supports for you. There are, n there's nothing, there's nothing to help a person who is struggling with disability or neurodivergency without that official diagnosis. 
And so it's like, yeah, (laughs) the system is broken. What are we supposed to do? And Kate is talking specifically about the American system when she says that. And maybe you're thinking, yeah, but we knew that was a mess. We're fine. We've got universal health care. But you'd be wrong. The parallel diagnosis wave here in Australia has created so much unmet demand that the exact same pattern is playing out here. For what it's worth, Sasha, who we spoke to at the start of this episode, has no idea what I'm talking about when I ask her whether there's anything attractive to her about an ADHD diagnosis. Oof. (laughs) Do I really know how to respond to that? I, uh, no, I don't agree with that, but I can see where you're coming from and I can see why some people would think that. And again, they're probably just, you're just chasing the medication half the time. It's like, it's not desirable to have a brain that can't fire in a straight line. The last time we spoke, she had just booked an appointment, two years after she first raised it with her GP. But it's still months away and she had to literally save up for it. And in 2023, that counts as a success story, which isn't good enough. Hence part two. And normally we would play the podcast theme here. I mean, I am kind of attached to it. But like I keep saying, we are not done. In part two of this story, we'll tell you what having ADHD or even getting it checked out is costing patients, how much some psychiatrists are making in the process, and the consequences of that. I thought it was a typo when I first read it because I was like, how on earth can something like this cost $2,500 because I just can't do it. You can subscribe on the ABC Listen app where you'll also find our other episodes about things like the world of edgy internet Catholicism and how polyamory took off. We've got range. Schmeitgeist is made by me and Love Up Our sound designer and producer Grant Walter and our producer Elsa Silverstein for ABC Every Day. Thanks for being here, and we'll catch you soon. You've been listening to an ABC podcast. Discover more great ABC podcasts, live radio, and exclusives on the ABC Listen app. Subscribe to listen to more free podcasts or download the ABC Listen app and stream ad-free.